VIU Online presents GEC 101 English Composition, Week 6 Practical Lecture, Writing for Diverse Multilingual Audiences. This lecture is presented by Dr. Laura Hills, Professor of English at Virginia International University. Differences exist in our diverse society. But what does that mean practically? The most important lesson as an academic writer is that we approach every writing task through our own cultural lens. And that lens is often invisible to us. We don't realize readily that we are looking at the world through that lens. So becoming more sensitive to that lens, to knowing I'm speaking here with an assumption from my own culture is critical in academic writing. It means we must avoid ethnocentrism, the idea that our culture is the right one, the best one, the center of the universe, because that isn't the reality. We must adopt bias-free language. Let's look at what that might mean. What's biased language? Well, what if we use a term such as flesh-colored? Well, what is flesh-colored? For many years, it meant a particular flesh of a lighter-skinned person. But that's very culturally specific. That's a biased term. And so, Using that as an adjective, it's a flesh-colored dress, a flesh-colored pair of pants, that, that's a very biased way of speaking. Another example. What's a spouse? What's a significant other? No matter what our opinions may be, the reality is that people interpret those terms in different ways today. And we must be careful to avoid bias in our language in academic writing. Remember that your perspective may not be everyone's perspective. What does it mean when you say something's domestic? Well, it depends what you're talk where you are when you say it. What's foreign? What's home? What's abroad? It all depends on where you are. If I said you if I was speaking or writing and said something about foreigners, well, what does that mean? Where am I? Who am I? So being very careful not to assume everyone will interpret those words the way we do. We also find that simple language is best for diverse audiences. But what does that mean practically? Well, one thing it means is to use shorter sentences and to avoid compound sentences. Let's take a look. Now this is really a long sentence. Bear with me here. Jason went to the hardware store on his way home from work where he bought some nails and a hammer and then he picked up his dry cleaning and finally he went to the supermarket to pick up some tomatoes and cucumbers so he could make a salad to go with his dinner. Grammatically there's nothing wrong with this sentence. And it does make sense, but it is very challenging to read a sentence that long for anyone, especially someone who may be approaching English as a second, third, or fourth language. So we can revise that. Jason ran three errands on his way home from work. First, he stopped at the hardware store to buy some nails and a hammer. Next, he picked up his dry cleaning. And finally, he went to the supermarket to buy some tomatoes and cucumbers. He wanted to use them to make a salad to go with his dinner. Not only have we broken this into shorter sentences and avoided the compounds, but we have some markers that tell the reader how to think about things. We say right up front, he ran three errands, first, next, and finally. That helps a great deal with comprehension. 
So how long should a sentence be? I had a high school English teacher who told me no sentence should ever be more than 22 words. I've also heard 16 words. I don't have a magic answer for you, no hard and fast rule, but I can tell you shorter sentences will work better for you. And if you are getting into 20 plus words, you have to ask, is it really necessary to be one sentence? Another strategy when writing for diverse audiences is to avoid double negative constructions. What are these? I'm going to give you some examples now. He was not unhappy. I want no more of your money. I do not disagree. Let's see if we can't buy some new t-shirts. Unless we don't hear from you, the order won't be canceled. You see how confusing that is? I hardly have none. I couldn't not cry at the end of the movie. I couldn't hardly breathe. Josephine is not unfamiliar to me, and it is not impossible. These are confusing, and they're not necessary. So when writing for any audience, but particularly diverse audiences, avoid these kinds of construction. Oh, one more. He's not going nowhere. <laughs> I still don't know what that exactly means. Another strategy academic writers often use is to include a glossary of terms. This is excellent in a longer research work, such as a, a thesis or a dissertation. Actually, it's a required component of a doctoral dissertation. And it helps a great deal for those who may not be familiar with the terms you are using specific to your discipline and your study. Another strategy is to define acronyms the first time you use them in your writing. This is good for all audiences, but especially those who may not be familiar with the acronym. What are acronyms? It's when we use letters in place of a full name. For example, NASCAR is the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing. WAC is the Women's Army Corps. NASDAQ is the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotations. SNAFU is the situation is normal, all fouled up. NASA is the National Aeronautical and Space Administration. HAZMAT stands for hazardous materials. ROYGIBIV means the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And OPEC is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. In formal writing, we first present the acronym or the abbreviation and then define it the first time and only the first time we use it in our paper. And we can define abbreviations as well. DTA, the Dental Technologists Association. DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles. GSO, General Services Officer. GM for General Motors. LGBT, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender. PNP, Positive, Negative, Positive. TIACREF is the Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association College Retirement Equities Fund. TLC, Tender Loving Care, and WNA, World Nuclear Association. There are gazillions of these kinds of abbreviations, and we forget when we're very close to a subject that not everyone will know what they mean. So the first time we use them, we should define them in formal writing. Remember, your audience, your readers, may not be native speakers of English. They may be non-native speakers and they may not know all of the slang, the idioms, the abbreviations, and the acronyms that you know. Your reader may also lack your language abilities and your knowledge. A startling statistic is that roughly 23 percent of Americans read below the eighth grade level. So when you are writing for a very diverse audience according to how much education they have had, you have to remember that certain kinds of writing will be difficult for readers who have a lower reading ability. But even in academic writing, 
your reader may not know as much about your topic as you do. So you are the expert and it's up to you not only to explain yourself but to bring your audience up to speed so they can follow your argument. Finally, remember that diverse audiences may not care about your topic as much as you do. Make your writing interesting to your reader by sharing a story, yours or someone else's. It's fine to be engaging. Tell your readers why they should care about animals and protecting them. Make them care. Entertain them. Bring them into your argument and make them curious to learn more. Get their attention right away. If the beginning of your paper is ho-hum and dull, it's an uphill battle. The very first part of your paper is extremely important, as is the title. If you get people interested right away, you can get some momentum going, and they'll continue to read and be interested. Think, how can I make my topic interesting to a diverse audience? This concludes the practical lecture for week six.